so hi everyone. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Elisa Lopez Lucia. I'm an associate professor at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, and I'm very happy to welcome all of the speakers today and all of you in the audience um, for this webinar on the EU action in the Sahel. Um, so first, can I ask actually everyone who is not speaking to turn the micro um, off so we don't have any kind of interference? Um, and I think for the videos, it's fine for the moment. It seems to be working okay. Um, before start, starting, I wanted to let you know that uh, this webinar is actually the first of a webinar series on the topic Trends of Convergence and Divergence in EU-Africa Relations, which is also part of a broader EU-funded Germany project entitled A Reassessment of Relations Between the EU and African Regionalisms which is coordinated by Franck Matthijs, who is here, and by myself, and also with the involvement of Amandine Languenon, who is also here. Uh, so the next two seminars uh, that will take place in the next two weeks will be on the post cotonou era and on the building of regional security coalitions. So I invite you to register if you're interested, and Franck Matthijs will put the links in the chat here, so you can have them. Uh, so without further ado, let's start with our topic of the day, which is the EU and the Sahel, new strategy, new instruments, new opportunities and problems. Uh, so we thought it was actually the right moment to reflect a bit on the action of the EU in the Sahel for, for these past years and on its future orientation as well. Uh, I mean, as you all know, in April, the EU released its new integrated strategy in the Sahel after having also recently announced the replacement of the African peace facility by a European peace facility. Uh, so, I mean, these two events uh, raise many questions, um, obviously, uh, both regarding the modalities of the EU's continuous engagement uh, in the Sahel and also concerning its status as a foreign policy actor in Africa. Uh, which used to be very development focused and has become much more multidimensional uh, by integrating and in particular in the Sahel a much stronger security dimension and also a stronger governance dimension, even if there has been a lot of debate on these issues uh, in the past months. Uh, so we have invited five excellent speakers uh, who have accepted to share their thoughts on these issues. Uh, so I'm going to introduce them briefly here. So we're going to have first uh, Pierre-Yves Boisty, uh, who is the head of the Secretariat of the Partnership for Security and Stability in the Sahel, so the P3S, uh, located at the European External Action Service. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Signe Marie Kolhartke, who is a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for International Studies, uh, followed by Delina Gosho, who is an associate fellow at EGMO, the Royal Institute for International Relations. Uh, then we listen to Andrew Lebovich, uh, who is a policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. And then we'll finish with Bernardo Venturi, who is an associate fellow at the Instituto Affaire Internationale and who is director of the Agency for Peace Building. So I've asked all speakers to reflect on a few issues, uh, depending also on their areas of expertise, um, such as, for example, uh, in which ways is the new EU South strategy a departure from the former one, and how have the objectives, the means of action, and the concept changed? Um, what are the challenges, strengths, and weaknesses of the EU action in the Sahel? Um, another question is, are human rights and, and rule of law issues going to be a problem for the EU's engagement uh, in the region in light of, I mean, first, the abuses committed by the Sahelian armed forces in these last years, and also in light of the two coup d'etat in less than one year in Mali, the failed coup in Niger, and the military takeover in Chad. Um, another question, which is quite important, I think, is should the G5 Sahel still be the EU's privileged partner? And how does the African peace and security architecture fit in the EU's engagements, uh, in particular with the creation of the new European peace facility? Uh, and finally, what are the new possibilities open and the potential risk as well posed by the European peace facility for the EU action uh, in the Sahel? So each of our presenters will speak for between five and 10 minutes. Uh, and then I will open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, and in the meantime, you can also ask questions in the chat that uh, Frank Matthijs will be collecting. Um, so to start this webinar, I'm going to give the floor to Pierre-Yves Boissy, who I hope is still connected. Pierre-Yves, are you there? Is it fine? Can you hear me? Yeah. So many thanks, many thanks, Elisa, and hello. 
So as I said, I'm, I'm, the, I'm, I'm within the AS as, a, as the head of the, of the Secretariat newly established, which is in charge of uh, organizing and ensuring the, the EU responsibility over the, 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 the P3S, the partnership for uh, security and stability in the Sahel. I was previously uh, the Sahel coordinator for the AS, also in charge of the revision of the Sahel strategy that you mentioned, Elisa. So this will be my um, 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 to, 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 to make a brief and uh, as concise as possible uh, uh, introduction to the whole EU integrated approach to the Sahel in terms of general principle, also in, in, in terms of case study. So, and, and I, will, I will let my distinguished colleague the opportunity to, to, to open questions, to express criticism since I I'm supposed to present the formal and official line on, on, the, on the EU integrated approach. So as I said, the, the EU uh, approach to Sahel is based on a long-standing commitment and engagement on different strands on development. So about uh, more than uh, uh, four have been sp spent since 2014 in the field of development. Uh, in terms of humanitarian assistance, more than one billion since the, for the same period, but also in terms of security, security approach, uh, in particular since 2011, uh, 2012. Uh, and this is uh, and key strategic priority for, for the EU, in particular since the turning point of 2012 that I mentioned, uh, corresponding to the, to the crisis in Mali, that we can see uh, uh, now uh, still the repercussion. Uh, the second element is the regional security uh, dimension, uh, also affecting uh, the security of Europe. And the third element was, of course, of course uh, the, the migration effect and, and issue since 2015. Uh, it, it has become um, less topical over the past year, but it's now, uh, 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 it's, it's now an increasing issue again. On this basis, so the, the EU has developed uh, a so-called integrated approach, that means in concrete, the strategic EU tools and instruments uh, in and for the Sahel in order to uh, ensure one decisive uh, which is the sustainability of the Sahel. This is a specific uh, test case in full line with the Lisbon Treaty uh, and also with the EU Global Strategy, uh, which was adopted in, in, in 2016. And uh, as such, this is a, a modality of what we call the EU Comprehensive Approach to a Crisis. And that's been a, a, a concrete and, and diverse response to a multifaceted crisis. And the, the third element, the fourth, is the security and development nexus. And, uh, uh, the security with the development and vice versa. And this is a guiding principle of the uh, uh, EU integrated approach to the side. Uh, it's a document that, that, uh, that I mentioned, and, I, uh, in this, uh, and, and this is in particular the Strategy for Security and Development in the Sahel in March 2011, the so-called EU, uh, EU uh, Strategy for the Sahel. This is the first one to be adopted uh, for the region uh, from uh, now. 20 of uh, of uh, strategy have been uh, of the same kind of did of uh, have been adopted uh, uh, it was initially based on two um, countries sorry um, namely uh, Mali Mauritania Niger and with is a uh, three main objective in terms of regional integration stability and security and longer term uh, uh, development uh, it, it, it was an evolutive strategy. It, it, was, it has been complemented by a regional action plan adopted in, to, in April 2000. Uh, possibility to update this strategy uh, with an extension of uh, uh, other country uh, constituting the, 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 
the G file style uh, uh, entity, uh, but also with uh, new uh, threats and challenges. The, 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 the prevention and the, the countering of radicalism, uh, the, 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 the creating appropriate conditions for use, migration, mobil migration mobility, and of course, border management, illicit trafficking, and international uh, organized uh, crime uh, in, in, in relation uh, uh, of, of what I mentioned under the, 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 the migration issue. Uh, in concrete, the EU integrated approach uh, relies on four pillars. One is a political dialogue and diplomatic action, ranging for a close uh, and regular dialogue with uh, the G5 style countries. The area of cooperation, namely development, but also, and, uh, but also uh, uh, political aspect, in particular, the situation, the peace process in Mali and other It encompasses in the field of security, CSDP with the ground uh, that are now regionalized, uh, specific structures, but also uh, via their mandate, which, have, uh, which are now uh, uh, extended in a, in, a, in a regional format. The first, the, the, the third pillar is of course the development cooperation that I mentioned. And the last one is of course the humanitarian assistance that I also mentioned. Uh, I mentioned the CSDP, so the three uh, security and defense uh, mission that are deployed uh, in the Sahel. Niger, and now with uh, so the, the one military mission, EUTM, uh, uh, to support the, the formation, the training, and the, 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 the operational training of the Malian uh, army, but it but it also extended uh, to other countries to the to the to the to the sub region, with now uh, a possibility to, to also in the in the in Burkina Faso. This is a, a, a recent, a very recent development that is that is uh, that is part of the regionalization as I mentioned. Uh, the implementation of the EU integrated approach it, uh, relies on two ele central elements on the field. There is a central role of the EU delegation. We are in charge of implementing this uh, strategy and the EU integrated approach. And in the HQ, we have, uh, uh, in the HQ, the, the headquarters, we have a task force Sahel uh, gathering all services involved in the, in the EU approach to the Sahel, ranging from CSDP, from uh, uh, colleague in INPA, but also ECHO, uh, which is able to, to, to have a, a clear coordination on the, on the best way to adjust and to adapt and to implement the EU integrated approach on, in, in a very uh, regular ma uh, manner. Uh, the recent evolution of the, in this approach, uh, we can mention in 2007, the digital revolution, this was the establishment of the Sahel Alliance. Uh, focusing on development with the objective of reinforcing the coordination of the the, 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 the the international contributor involved in development in the Sahel region, which was uh, complemented on the security side uh, two years uh, after by the P3S Partnership for, security, for Stability and Security in the Sahel. Uh, uh, Encompass now uh, included in the broader framework of the coalition for Sahel. Uh, the P3S correspond to the two central pillars of the of the coalition. Uh, uh, this is the fight against terrorism. The second, so first pillar of the of the P3S is strengthening the uh, security and defense uh, capability of the Sahel countries. The third pillar, also corresponding to the other pillar of the, of the P3S, is the return and basic services throughout the territories. And uh, the fourth pillar is, of course, longer term development. Uh, on the approach uh, to uh, EU approach to the Sahel, have been uh, proposed 
uh, and this is also reflected in the in the in the in the in the in the revision of the EU size strategy that you mentioned, Elisa. Uh, it is based uh, in addition to the uh, innovation that you mentioned, the Alliance Sahel, the P3S, and the coalition. It also relies on what we call the so-called transactional approach. Uh, this corresponds to the mutual accountability that the need that we have we need uh, uh, to have a more close and demanding dialogues with our uh, with our uh, G5 Sahel counterparts and partners. Uh, it also relies on the fact that EU, as I mentioned, is ensuring the the uh, an overall responsibility coordination uh, uh, res uh, responsibility over the P3S within the within the coalition for Sahel. And as I said, all these are reflected in the revision of the EU uh, Sahel strategy, which has adopted uh, in, via uh, council conclusion. So it's a new document, a new kind of, uh, of approach, uh, including uh, in the form of council conclusion. And the very last uh, dimension and development that I would like to mention before uh, leaving the floor to other participants uh, was, of course, the Enjamena Summit uh, and the ministerial meeting of the coalition that follows. So the, the Enjamena Summit of the coalition is in uh, February with a significant call uh, for a civilian and uh, political surge, uh, taking over the military surge with, with which was decided one year ago in uh, uh, earlier in Po, and this means in concrete that uh, we have to now to insist on the fact that we should insist on on the establishment of the state presence as a best provider and deliverer of basic services, provided that uh, it is based on the on a, on a clear uh, consultation with the, the the population affected in the most uh, uh, vulnerable region. This is precisely what we are doing now in, uh, within the EU and uh, via the, the P3S, the operationalization of this uh, civilian and political surge, uh, insisting on, on, on what I mentioned, the, pri the, 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 the identification of, 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 of priorities of uh, most uh, urgent and essential services and uh, the possibility to uh, to establish the state presence on the basis of an uh, international approach not limited to the security and defense forces uh, which are able to provide the essential services and to establish uh, whenever possible the trust between the state and the, the the population concerned. This is the main challenges of the of the of the summit. We were supposed to have uh, uh, another uh, follow up summit at the end of this month, uh, but we are not sure, uh, given the situation, given the situation in Mali in particular, that uh, this summit could take place. It uh, would have been an occasion to uh, to 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 present some. Uh, uh, kind of deliverables on the operation of this surge and other aspects which uh, uh, a roadmap. So that's it for the for the presentation on the on the on the on the on the integrated approach uh, to uh, to the to, to the Sahel. And of course, I'm 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 I'm, I'm very uh, uh, I can't wait to 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 to. To listen to the to the to the to presentation of the of the other uh, participant, uh, Elisa, over to you. Thank you very much, Yves, uh, for this uh, comprehensive overview of the EU's activities and, and action and the last changes, which are indeed reflected in, in the new uh, integrated strategy of the EU. Uh, so now I give the floor to Signe, um, who is going to talk also about this for a few minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Elisa, and to the organizers and also to Monsieur Poissy for this uh, comprehensive overview, taking stock of um, uh, the, the last 10 years and the new strategy. Um, and I'm also taking up the encouragement to be uh, a bit critical. Um, perhaps just to provide some brief context, we have indeed seen a gradual securitization of the Sahelian space. 
uh, which has accelerated also since 2015. One could also say that after 10 years of engagement now, the development and security has deteriorated. More than 2 million people are internally displaced due to escalating violence. And in the light of the most recent undemocratic events following the death of Idris Dibi in Chad and the coup within the coup in Mali, it really prompts the question of whether the EU and its international cooperation partners have the right approach to the Sahel. Um, I will focus mostly on security, perhaps also some political issues, and hopefully my other uh, very um, uh, delighted to be here with all my uh, extremely great colleagues. Uh, so maybe they will also touch upon other aspects of this indeed integrated and comprehensive approach. Uh, last night, the news broke that France is suspending its joint military operations with Mali, the consequences of which, as we speak, are still unknown. But uh, for the EU, um, of course, this has uh, increased, um, has a lot of impact as one of the key strategic priorities also mentioned in this new uh, Sahel strategy is the active fight against terrorism and cross-border insecurity um, through existing new and revised initiatives. Of course, the European Peace Facility and the Takuba Task Force being cases in point. Well, underpinning this overall framework is this idea of the mutual beneficial partnerships between the EU and the Sahelian state. And in this context, as this new strategy also focuses on governance and accountability, which is indeed needed and pertinent. Uh, but I'd like to just point to three um, uh, issues in relation to what I term the problematic security partnerships in the Sahel that I want to focus on. And perhaps we can also uh, stir some debates around that. Um, the first is the, the conception of our security is their security. Then there's secondly, the need for capacity building of so-called fragile states, and then finally, um, how to get the politics right in all of this. As um, for the first point, uh, the uh, EU foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell uh, clearly framed it last month, uh, their security is our security. While this um, framing also reflect the more inward looking focus on European security in the EU's approach to external action, the idea that we need to deter cross-border threats from the region before they reach the European continent. Um, the question is really, I think, whether they, the Sahelian state or their um, political actors, always share this perception. And to what extent do we also overlook the perspective from the countries and their political elites? And this also rate, uh, relates to this point and a perception that I hear again and again, at least in the Danish environment, uh, as for informing a lot of the engagements also to uh, the EU and uh, EU-related military approaches, is this idea of uh, state fragility. It's also like one of the only uh, existing long-term exit strategy is that uh, we need to capacity build um, because no one in Europe after Iraq and Afghanistan have uh, has the appetite for having too much boots on the ground. So the idea is that if we train and capacity build these incapable state and their forces, they will eventually do as we would like them to do. And through that, we can then outsource the handling of our own security agendas to these states. However, this image of poorly trained soldiers, I believe the site in 2013 used the image of um, soldiers in flip-flops and home-tailored uniforms in the so-called fragile states. It doesn't really take into account this image of the resilience, one could say, of powerful elites in the partner countries and how these elites are fully capable of pursuing their own interests and create rooms of maneuvering, which at the moment for authoritarian military regimes seems to be expanding in the wrong direction. And in that perspective, the outsourcing of our own political security agenda for terrorism, migration and cross-border uh, organized crime does involve a risk. And I think the, the, the question remains to be asked, to what extent can we actually exercise control over these developments and the actors that push them? The EU dreams about controlling the ungoverned Sahelian borderlands and the illicit flows and to prevent these perceived threats from reaching EU territory. But to what extent are we in fact 
producing more disorder at the border through making available increasingly militarized instrument. So maybe the question is also how do we assess these risks and how do we avoid that these unintended boomerang effects hits us in the back of the neck while we are not paying enough attention uh, and not to be too uh, naive about who we're cooperating with and through what means because the the, um, the point can be that uh, too much of this can end up uh, with a contradiction in the approach where the commitment to promotion of human rights and conflict uh, resolution really doesn't go hand in hand while boosting combat capability of authoritarian partners. So this might risk undermining peace and stability and the EU's reputation as a normative actor aiming to do good in the world when weapons fall in the wrong hands of military that abuse and overthrow governments. So um, the third question, uh, which is the one about our security, is their security, also goes for my last point concerning how do we get the politics right. Um, and we've also seen before that the perception of who is the enemy number one may not be the same in Paris as it is in Bamako or Niamey. And this, of course, also touches upon the uh, contentious issue of political negotiations with jihadists. Um, as much as the new strategy acknowledged the need for po getting the politics right, it's France as one member state uh, seems to be more occupied with excluding jihadists from the table than punishing coup leaders. Uh, and of course, France is also needs and depends on these partnerships for continuing their own military operations, core being there by invitation. Uh, so, um, and of course, also development engagement needs partnerships. Um, um, but several states and civil society actors have called upon the need to find more pragmatic solutions to peace and reconciliation. So how much ownership can we expect from Sahelian states on this question? And to what extent do our interests converge there? We can also see with now the US um, negotiating with Taliban, maybe this is um, a more pragmatic um, approach, uh, but is this uh, foreseeable? Maybe this is one of the questions we can also raise in the discussion. Finally, I just want to say that I think uh, another logic that we're also increasingly hearing is this uh, zero-sum game, which is uh, constantly repeated that if we are not there to engage, then other uh, non-state, uh, non-liberal actors uh, will. So everybody is there to spy on each other. The Chinese are there. Uh, Erdogan, uh, the Russians, and all that. And but but I'm also wondering sometimes if this idea is pushing too much of a logic of necessity that prevents the EU from actually taking the right decisions. So just um, taking the opportunity to stir some questions, um, I will end my talk here and looking very much forward to what you other guys have to say. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Signe, uh, for raising these very important issues and, and questions around the governance, accountability, and, and also very importantly on the, on the politics of the intervention and getting the politics right uh, when you intervene. Uh, so now I'm going to give the floor to Delina. Thank you, Elisa. Um, <laughs> I will try to keep this short and sweet. Um, so that so that we can have um, a little time for conversation later. I want to make three points with regard to European action in the Sahel, and I will incorporate some doubts and questions I have on the current um, and the future work of the specifically of the P3S in the region. Um, I think is really is a really good occasion to have uh, Pierre Yves uh, uh, with with us today. So je vais profiter. Um, so my first point relates to the European understanding of um, stabilization and governance. The word stabilization um, is used in the document about 20 times in the in the new EU stra uh, strategy. And given that this concept is very different if we are speaking with someone in Berlin or if we're speaking with someone in Paris, I keep wondering how the EU interprets the term because I am I'm definitely yet to pin it down. So we know that Germany prioritizes a civilian oriented approach to stabilization. Uh, Berlin links political process to broader efforts and consider this to be an endeavor that includes the Ministry of Defense, but is led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. On the other hand, France 
appears seems to be tackling the issue from a more security centered angle and i'm not saying anything new here and um, the decision for example to intervene in support of former chadian president Debi in the bombings uh, of NED in uh, 2019 um, symbolizes this type of stabilization approach so <laughs> Governance in all this, in all this understanding of stabilization, which I tend to see as an umbrella for a series of concepts such as governance, for example, um, is a priority for the new European Sahel strategy. But it seems to me to be too often conflated with stability and stabilization, this idea of governance and good governance, rather than being a measure of democratic principles. Um, and so I, I often tend to forget this myself and uh, it feels like waking up from a bad dream every time I realize that governance should mean something different. Um, so this uncertainty that derives from losing leaders like Debi and Chad, um, I find to be often quite exaggerated. The questions tend to be in Brussels especially, um, who will be patrolling the tri-border area now, who will be providing MINUSMA with its most capable soldiers. Um, and we know that the Chadian forces may be elite forces, they are more capable than other forces in the region, but uh, professionalism of the armed forces does not just include the way they behave in combat, but also whether they protect civilians instead of abusing them, as the Chadian forces tend to do um, a little too often. Um, also, we, we seem to tend to forget, and once again, Brussels is, is the center of this analysis, um, that while we believe that Debi, for example, and I'm using Debi as an example here, but I could be speaking about Mali as well, while Debi is keeping the region stable, um, reaction to abuse or a lack of basic services such as education, a credible judici judicial system, uh, health, proper health provisions, um, are definitely mounting at the margins. And we see this both with the assassination of, of Debi, but also with the double uh, coup in Mali. So good governance, doesn't happen, and I think this is a fundamental point of, of this presentation, um, good governance doesn't happen after we've cleared, cleared the area of terrorists. Um, good governance should happen supposedly in parallel. I think uh, Nina Wilen uh, specifically has called, uh, has talked about the military civilian complex imbalance. Um, and I think in the Sahel, this is, the Sahel is certainly a case in point. My second point um, refers to how the EU communicates externally. And this, my, my last two points are quite technical um, and connect to what I'm going to ask Pierre-Yves uh, quite uh, directly. So the EU seems to be relying on the office of the EU special representative for communication purposes. Um, but it doesn't seem to rely on the EAS nor on the P3S, the secretariat specifically. Um, and the way the EU communicates, even at the special representative office level, um, through words like laboratory, strategic autonomy, or testing ground, the Sahel is seen as a testing ground for EU um, foreign policy, this new European sovereign idea. Um, and this constant rhetoric that if we want to be secure, then we must secure the Sahel, which automatically means that if there is insecurity there, there is insecurity here. Um, I'm wondering whether we are entirely aware, and this also connects to what, what Sine was just saying, if we're entirely aware of the difficult position that this puts us with regard to Sahelian leaders. And when we say Sahelian leaders, we all know that we don't just mean leaders who are uh, corrupt, non-democratic, authoritarian, but we also mean leaders that are changing way too often for us to establish meaningful diplomatic relations. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that this is uh, this is easy talk. Um, I wouldn't want to be in the shoes of, of specifically Pierre Yves uh, at this moment, but I do believe that this communication strategy, if it is a strategy, um, may may serve us well internally. It serves us well within the EU because we describe a dangerous uh, potential threat, um, which justifies, of course, our external action, but it is definitely detrimental externally because it exposes us to blackmailing quite significantly. Um, so the question to Pierre-Yves then becomes, how does the secretariat expect to align priorities with these leaders that tend to be not too accountable and how to communicate it? Last brief point um, is simply one of feasibility. So analysts, academics uh, tend to be quite criticized, I, I think, within the EIS, but also within European governments in general for 
providing very many criticisms, uh, but very few recommendations. Um, so I, I want to... I want to use this occasion to ask whether some of the recommendations that we make are feasible or not. Um, and if they're not feasible, then we will stop making these recommendations and make others. Um, one of the main things that I think about in this work on the Sahel derives from discussion with program offices based in the region, but also experience in other contexts, such as, for example, um, Afghanistan and Iraq, quite specifically. Um, and is one on the learning experience that should derive from effective monitoring and evaluation. And I know that this sounds technical, but I feel like it's very political also. Um, so, so we hear constantly reported from the region, this gap between the work that they do, specifically our delegations, our civilian and military missions, but also, and, and then the way this is translated into HQ. So, there are indicators, there is proper monitoring and evaluation, but there doesn't seem to be a learning experience that derives from when projects fail. There is, there is a huge number of programs that aren't working well in the Sahel. Are we changing our approach once people who are working on them from the region tell us about it? Over to you, Elisa. I'm done. <laughs> Okay. Thanks a lot, Delina, for this very concise but very dense uh, contribution. Uh, and I think you're right, it's, it's very important to pinpoint the meaning of these concepts like stabilization and, and governance that actually frame the EU action and, and orient it. And I also want to thank you for, for raising questions about the impact of the vocabulary, you know, the EU uses to, to describe its activities and, and objectives uh, in the Sahel, which I, I think we do need to reflect on. So, so thank you very much. And I'm giving the floor to uh, Andrew. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. I'll also try to be brief. It's also um, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to be with such friends and, and, and excellent colleagues. Uh, it also makes my job easier to be able to speak after uh, interventions like that, because, of course, everything's already been said, uh, so I can be brief. Um, but I actually want to uh, to pick up a bit on the on one of the themes that Delina was just focusing on, um, this question of, of input to the strategy and how things have shifted over time. And I think one of the, the funny parts about that is, that, of course, uh, the my, my fellow speakers and I, and several others, I think, have been involved at various stages in providing input to the revision of the strategy. Uh, I think we've all been in discussions at various times about the revision of the strategy. And when you read the strategy, uh, you can see the impact of this, especially in terms of some of the, uh, the, the critiques that were leveled against past strategies, especially with regards to including language on political progress, um, maintaining a political role and a political understanding of conflict, uh, and also a, a political aspect to interventions in the region, um, and also this focus on governance and stabilization uh, that Delina mentioned. Um, the problem with that, of course, is that uh, it is great that those things have been included, but I think it's still, the EU is still in the process, as EU member states are, as the United States is, of actually trying to define what that means. So we've now gotten to the point where um, no one can talk about intervention in the Sahel without focusing on governance. No one can talk about it without focusing on politics. Um, but those terms actually have to be defined. And and that's where some of the, the challenge lies, including in initiatives like the, the P3S. Um, and this is where I think there's still a tendency to define uh, things like governance interventions in very technical ways. Um, so looking at governance, to, again, to pick up, again, this language of capacity building uh, as something important. So the idea of building infrastructures, the idea of uh, building out ministries, of creating contexts in ways that are important and that are certainly necessary, but incomplete uh, with regards to a kind of comprehensive or coherent strategy. Um, and one of the, the challenge of this, uh, challenges of this, for instance, uh, and not to pick uh, too much on Pierre-Yves, um, but the there is an aspect that remains of still, even though we now include governance, for instance, in the common discussion of the nexus of security, development, and governance, um, the focus is still very much on security and development. And this idea that those two work hand in hand, but then governance somehow will will come afterwards. And the problem with that, of course, is that we also see this in in the very common language of the return of the state, of encouraging the return of the state. But that doesn't deal with an essential political question, which is what if the state is part of the problem? 
or the ways that Sahelian states, for instance, have functioned, the way that European states have uh, have worked with Sahelian states on certain issues in the past, the way that state representatives sometimes have committed abuses, have uh, not listened to local communities, have not included them in their own decision-making process and their own actions. All of that makes up the way that um, communities that people perceive the state and the way that they interact with the state. And so if those fundamental issues also have to change, the return of the state is actually part of the problem. And so uh, I'm I'm a bit of a broken record on the subject, uh, but I still feel that it's very important that we not talk about return of the state by itself, but that we also talk about what kind of state returns, especially in some rural areas where the state has uh, where the state has often not been present across the region, or where the intervention of state institutions or state representatives is very limited. This is where again interventions that focus only on the return of the state or the presence of state functionaries is woefully incomplete and potentially quite dangerous in terms of stability, particularly when looking at a complex security environment where alternative groups, including jihadist groups, uh, propose other governance models, even if they are limited in their own way, but where there is an alternative that is available to at least some populations. Um, and so there's also been, I want to say, there's also been progress in the language of accountability, uh, this idea of the civilian surge uh, within the P3S is not a bad one per se, and it's certainly something to be encouraged, but even within EU member states, um, if you ask people about the civilian surge, uh, including some proponents of such an idea, uh, most of them, at least in my experience, will say that it doesn't actually exist, at least for now. Um, and that there's still quite a significant imbalance to be corrected between uh, the integration of civilian representatives and civilian priorities into the situation and reorienting sometimes security priorities to actually respond more directly to political imperatives. And that's an ongoing challenge. It's something that, of course, uh, the U.S. government dealt with for many years in its own conflict zones. But it's, a, it's an area where I don't think sufficient lessons have been learned, including in uh, ongoing discussions about stabilization, as uh, as Zulino quite rightly mentioned. I also think that there's another problem. Uh, there are two other problems of the limits of EU imagination and the limits of EU rules. And this is where, for instance, in terms of um, something like security accompaniment, capacity building, training, uh, the EU missions remain uh, somewhat too limited in their ability to actually continue training. This is where Task Force de Cuba is supposed to take up essentially what the EU training mission in Mali cannot do, which is accompany troops in the field. Um, and again, that's that's something that's a, a sort of uh, adaptive approach to deal with the limits on EU intervention. But again, it is incomplete. It is not as effective as it could be because you still have different component parts, you have different priorities. You have on the one hand, a training mission under the EU, and on the other hand, a special forces coalition that operates under uh, under Operation Barkhan, under French command. So again, we have the possibility for a disconnect here um, that could undermine some of the stated international priorities. Uh, another issue is, and this gets also to a point that, uh, that Delina made about uh, competing or differing priorities between member states. Um, for instance, when we see language that that enters into the new EU strategy uh, about decentralization, for instance, uh, this is also a German priority, a long-standing German priority, but not only Germany. Uh, but at the same time, I think that this language sometimes misunderstands how decentralization can function in the region and confuses the legitimacy, the often very real legitimacy of local representatives, communal representatives, traditional leaders, and religious leaders um, with how to actually implement governance. And that there needs to be a much more coherent connection between a functional national state that can then decentralize political authority, decentralize resources, and simply an institutional decentralization. Because we really want to avoid uh, what happened in Mali after the 1990s, where there was a decentralization in form but not a decentralization in function that actually made governance much, uh, much more fragile and helped contribute to the current wave of crises that we've seen over the past decade uh, in Mali and then across the region. 
And then uh, finally, I think we also have to be wary of the ways in which individual member state priorities and policies can also impact the overall strategy. And this is where an issue like migration uh, is very important, where EU policies on migration have often been shaped by a hard security approach, even if that is not always explicit, um, in ways that actually undermine stability in the region, undermine uh, local economies, and also contribute to a different kind of securitization of the region where EU member states, and I don't think we need to say which ones because everyone is aware of this, uh, often seek out direct partnerships specifically with migration in mind um, and encourage sometimes the growth and power and development of armed groups who will serve as proxies for suppressing migration, but in ways that also impact the balance of power in local politics and local security. And so I think to step back a bit, uh, I'm looking at all these questions, and I didn't even get to the question of negotiations, which is a very good one, but maybe we can bring that up in the Q&A. Um, we are moving towards slowly better coordination and more coherent approaches. There is progress, and, and I'm wary also of the, the idea that outside analysts are always critical and that we don't offer solutions. Uh, I, I too have had that argument with EU officials. Um, but I, I do think that it is important that we actually maintain this pressure um, because there can be such a tendency to also become complacent in the idea that the form has gotten better, that uh, certain ideas are now being taken into account, and thus that is okay, that is enough, we can continue. We also have to continue pushing to, um, to make this language real and to make these improved understandings within organizations like the EU into something that can be translated uh, on the ground in the region in ways that are um, sensitive to local context and dynamics, but also can be beneficial to regional populations. And so I will wrap it up there. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andrew, also for this very uh, interesting uh, and insightful intervention. And thanks for problematizing these issues around the, the meaning of governance, which I think is, is really an important uh, aspect of the EU action uh, at the moment and also really a stake for the EU um, as its definition and operationalization is going to impact also a lot the success of this um, EU integrated approach of this new uh, South strategy. Uh, so to finish, uh, we're going to have the intervention of uh, Bernardo Venturi. I give you the floor. Thanks, Elisa. Thanks, uh, Frank and Amandine. I'm very glad to see you all and thanks for this invitation. Um, I'm glad to be here to discuss with, with my colleagues today about um, the EU's priorities on, on this ahead. Uh, so much has been said. I would like just to elaborate a little bit more on, on, uh, on three issues and then I will conclude with, uh, with two remarks. Um, I will try to have more political angle, so not to, to, to repeat what, what is mentioned in, in the main documents in this ahead strategy. And, uh, and in that perspective, let me start from, uh, from the, the political dimension that is highlighted in, in the new Sahel, Sahel strategy. I think that many of us um, recommend that priority before. So in the last years, we really recommend to to have more, more attention to, to governance and, and to the political priority. Uh, and I think this is a, a big shift, and I have the impression that uh, many EU officers are often listening to, to experts, and I would like to, to thank for this, for this effort. Um, the point is also, but the point is also about not just uh, implementing or, or mentioning different different points in the strategic documents, but also in terms of, of, uh, of how to measure them and how to really to, uh, to monitor and to measure them and to how to prioritize on, on some of them. So let me start with, with potential indicators of, in terms of, of the political dimension and, and good governance. Um, as we said, as uh, the other colleagues said before, our governance is, is a buzzword. It's mentioned by, by everyone, but at the end of the day, it's not clear what, what is that. And I think really some, some indicators should, should be there. The first one is in terms of 
of rule of law and uh, respect of the Constitution and, uh, and of human rights. And that's the first, uh, first cluster of, of indicators. And the second one is in terms of, of delivering for, for the local population. So in terms, for instance, of human development. Um, Elena's mentioned public services, and indeed that's a really a good, a good criterion to, 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 to measure if, if a government is delivering with its own apparatus. And, uh, and indeed in Chad, I mean, after 30 years of, of a regime, um, many European countries, and also to some, some instance, European institutions were, were mentioning a good ally, we lost a good ally, um, but a lie for what? I mean, just just security concern. What does really security mean? Because the point is that we would think just um, security as a ceiling border. I mean, that could be a criterion. But if we think security in the long term uh, with a country where I mean the the human development levels are at the very bottom at the global level. Uh, where there are a huge internal division and the local people, they don't have political voice, they don't have social space. That's, that's not good governance in my, for my indicators and in my understanding. And that not will guarantee future stability or future uh, peace and security in, in the area. And the second point is really about uh, priorities and, and political priorities, because uh, I really appreciate documents like the, the Sahel strategy and indeed all the checklist is, is there. But then when he, we hear the, the, the political speeches, they're really pushing for some priority. And 90% and of what we hear from Boris or from others really in terms of hard security and and military security. So the point is also about connecting, um, not just uh, like a checklist what, with everything there, um, but also to, to highlight some priorities. What are the, the priorities? So uh, we know that the Sahel is really the, uh, the main region where the EU is implementing its integrated uh, strategy, integrated approach. But in practical terms, really prioritizing more security, security tools, security instruments, and some military approach. Um, and sometimes in, in Borel's world, I have the impression that the EU is building a strong and solid foreign policy only if it's pushing for, uh, for cooperation on, on uh, on military term, and now with the European Peace Facility on uh, on laser weapons on, on lethal equipment, um, and that I think is a little bit. Uh, mm, mm, I mean, uh, is, it, is it, let's say that is a limitation, uh, at least for the integrated approach, um, and uh, it's a, I think to some extent is still an old way, an old fashioned way to deal with foreign policy that the EU is strong only if it's pushed for, for military cooperation. And to some extent, it's also a form of, of masculinity in foreign policy that we should balance in, in, other, in other terms. Um, and indeed, my third point is about, is about militarizations. In, in the past, I, I used the, the concept of, of securitization for this for this region, I think it was uh, was uh, was pertinent for several reasons that I will not repeat here. Um, and in the last month, I debate about militarization or, or securitization, and some other analysts were more for for securitization as such. And I think now there is also a shift toward militarization because um, we see what happened in. in Mali and now the power is really in military's hands and that's an issue and that is really also changing the perception if we think to, to French reaction, yes it is French reaction, uh, if we think to, to Chad and the, the current let's call it transition or what. Um, so there is really a shift toward militarization and also from the EU's perspective, perspective 
and the European Peace Facility is pushing for more military uh, and full military cooperation. So the risk here is really that the EU is starting to use an instrument in a very delicate and, and dangerous moment for, for this for this area. So I'm really skeptical about that and and, uh, and perhaps we have to, to push for more a more uh, balance in terms of civilian civilian power and that's really a, a priority. Um, let me conclude with, with a couple of issues. The first one is that uh, yesterday uh, Emanuela del Rey was nominated as the new special EU envoy for, for the Sahel. She is the Italian former deputy uh, minister for, for foreign relations, foreign affairs and uh, I think she, she really has she's a uh, she has a background in development cooperation. So she has a broad view. It's not just as in, to some extent she's able to balance some approaches just related to security and military approach. Um, but to some other extent, I I had the impression that during uh, uh, her position at the Italian MFA. She was discussing a lot in terms of the development cooperation. Uh, she's really well prepared on African issues, but at the same time, she was not able to push forward an agenda in some political, uh, in political terms. So she was not able to push some policies forward. Um, um, so that's my preoccupation now, that she will have a lot of meeting. Um, but she will not. She will not be able to um, to navigate the Brussels dynamics. So to, to really to 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 manage relation with the AS, with uh, with the high representative, and, and so on and so forth. That's my my preoccupation today. But I hope it will not um, become reality. And let me conclude with uh, with a quick focus on on civil society because I. I attended a presentation a few weeks ago, just three or four weeks ago, of a report from um, con conducted by a couple of experts within the CSDP mission. And basically, they analyzed the, the civilian CSDP mission in, in Africa, but not only in Africa. And, uh, and the relation between the CSDP staff and the local civil society. And, uh, and the results they are finding were basically that the relations are, are very limited. So the contacts between uh, CSDP staff and, and the local civil society is extremely limited often through the usual suspects, so the, the main NGOs in, at the capital level, not in the regions, and, uh, and through the civil society focal point, so an, a special person within the mission, special officer that is dealing with civil society. So basically the idea that there is a, a weird animal out there that is civil society and uh, we need a focal point of maintaining the relation with, with them. And it is not a task, it's part of the daily work of the whole CSDP mission, at least uh, of its main components. And I will stop here and looking forward for the QA session. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Bernardo, for, uh, for bringing this political perspective uh, here. And thanks, all of you, because I think your interventions were actually very complementary. I know you prepared a little bit before uh, to make sure they were uh, current together. So thank you for that. Um, so it's great also because we have time to have a good discussion with the audience, uh, because you kept it uh, very brief as well. Uh, so let's open now the discussion to the audience. So if you have um, a question, raise your electronic hands. I'll give you the, the floor and also please introduce yourself first before asking the question. Well, I have one question in the chat. 
which um, I can, which which just ca came through. So I'll, um, uh, I'll I'll just read it out. So on on behalf of uh, of Matteo da Rolando. Um, so when when addressing the issue of the securization of the EU approach towards Sahel, security and CSDP missions are usually the main reference. If possible, I wanted to ask what is the impact on EU development policies? What is the role of former DG DEFCO, so INPAR now, and to what extent the EU indeed risks losing its development role? So I think that's, that's quite a pertinent question that also speaks a bit to our next webinar, which will be specifically on, on, on development issues. But um, so, uh, so thank you, Matteo. Um, over, over to you, Elisa. Uh, yeah, well, if there's no more questions for the moment, we'll leave some time for, for people to reflect. Maybe actually I'm going to re-ask some of the questions that you haven't talked to. I know it's maybe not your, like, you know, more personal interest in that, but I still would like to hear your thoughts about that and also the thoughts of, of Pierre-Yves. Um, so one of my questions was, should the G5 Sahel still be the East privileged partner um, in the region? And, and how does the African peace and security architecture fit in this EU engagement, uh, and in particular, what would be the impact of the creation of the European uh, peace facility on that? So if you have any insight about that, I would be really happy to, to hear this. And the other question was a bit more kind of zoom in, and you already touched a little bit upon that, but, you know, in which ways human rights uh, issues and, and rule of law issues with uh, the various coup d'etat uh, are going to impact on, on the EU's engagement uh, in the Sahel? Do you think they're going to have any kind of impact also? So I leave it, I, I let you answer and then we'll wait to see if there's, there are other questions. Can I ju just address the, um, the joint force question very quickly? And then I'd be very happy to hear from Pierre-Yves, given that we did ask a lot. Um, just um, yeah, on the joint force, I think supposedly, I mean, this is this was the the intention and the reason why it was created. So, um, I still think that there is some relevance to it. Um, there was there was one recent, fairly recent. I mean, this was 2018, uh, so right after it was created, um, which is uh, this UN mandated or UN pushed for um, idea on protection of civilians and so on, how to do reporting and legal accountability um, on how the joint force operates. Um, and very recently, one of the pillars, the sixth pillar um, of this UN mandated mechanism was adopted, is called the CITAC, Misad, again, is quite technical, but it refers to reporting whenever there are abuses or civilian casualties um, done, conducted um, by the by joint force soldiers. I think this is very, very interesting because it did receive quite a lot of attention at a, at a fairly high level within the, the joint force. And I think it could be one step in the right direction for using this same mechanism for Sahelian forces, national forces, I mean. So this is, again, just one of the elements of these, one of the one one of these seven pillars so it isn't of course comprehensive it doesn't include legal uh, legal accountability but it is one first step and if this one pillar is then adopted by the fama by the by the nigerian armed forces and the burkina Bay armed forces um, this could lead to some some possible um, positive effect I also I also think just to add on to that that um, I, I agree completely that these are good initiatives and it's definitely a, a, a start to improving accountability and improving reporting. Um, but I also think that there needs to be more pressure uh, and more of an engagement with uh, the joint force, but also with uh, with G5 countries specifically or individually to actually improve prosecution of cases where abuses are registered. Um, this is very important, and also not just to improve prosecution, but to improve public communication about them. Uh, I think that kind of public communication actually sends a very strong uh, message about governance and accountability that is something to be encouraged and has sometimes been uh, been lagging, in, particularly in Mali, with a very complicated uh, series of dynamics within the Malian military even before the most recent coup. Uh, but I do think that that would be a very important way of uh, of approaching these issues and improving the impact of accountability, not just the fact of accountability. Yeah, if I could also just tie a point to that, I think um, some, yeah, I think this, 
touches upon the question also of security sector reform. And I think just from my own field work, um, this is definitely in Mali that that has been also in terms of this problematic partnerships, a very difficult agenda for the partners to, to raise also because it touches upon these questions of sovereignty. Uh, and, and I think there's an interesting game here that sometimes played out that, that the EU is in this position that they have to give a little, they have to provide the military, they have to show that now you're getting like these, uh, uh, yeah, more military and more, I should say, company in the fields and, and, and um, arms and weapons, which is also understandable from the point of view of having 20,000 soldiers in the country without to be, them, them being able to arm them. But, but, but there's also a very reluctance and very little interest to sort of push for this. So I think that has been, that's like a core of the issue in this problematic partnership that, that there hasn't been a lot of incentive in the Malian armed forces to actually push for um, security sector reform, which would also then talk about how do you institutionally actually strengthen this. And But I'm also wondering a little bit about with the, the focus on the G5 Sahel, I think the criticism has also been that there's too much focus perhaps on these states, which has sort of come to define uh, what the Sahel is, um, which is, of course, a, a political constructed category. So it could also be interesting to perhaps look at um, more best practices is do we have other countries where we actually see f forces behaving well, being better, having a bit of, a better uh, relationship and perception of that security is not just securing armed forces, it's also about providing security to populations. And I think that relationship and that perception of protection and providing security for people is something that needs to be built and it's an extremely difficult uh, process. But if we have examples of perhaps also other militaries where that has worked, maybe uh, that it, it could also be somewhere to build from just to be a little bit sort of uh, constructive and not just critical. <laughs> Uh, Pierre-Yves, maybe you have uh, something to uh, to share with us on these issues? Oui, uh, see, because it's very, very bad in my side. So it's proved that the pair of the Petrozers is not so good equipped as all other universities. But I will, I will do my best to, to, to answer the the multiple questions that, that were asked in uh, I would say that indeed this question on all um, discussion is very useful as we are precisely in the phase of elaboration of the, the famous civilian and, and political search, which is as such a good um, a good evolution and in particular as concerned the risk of over securization, militarization of the EU that I wouldn't exaggerate because the EU is not a military act actor, it won't be a military actor. Uh, but as said, he has, and this is the challenge, the male challenge of the EU approach to Sahel, not a, not a test case or whatever, you're, you're definitely right, Benina, on this. Uh, but the main challenge is to have a more balanced approach in order to respond in real time to the uh, to the, the, the challenges in the region. And the fact is, uh, you mentioned it, uh, Signe, the main uh, uh, threat and uh, challenge is the uh, constant deterioration of the security in the region. This is something that is the main priority expressed by the, milit the, the, the political uh, authorities uh, uh, from our uh, of our political dialogue that we have uh, at the level of the HRVP, be it uh, 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 Federica Mogherini or Joseph uh, Borrell. Uh, and this concern also, this was an a block of the stabilization that we are actually also in the process of elaborating on this uh, because we have to, f to find a common ground what is stabilization uh, and uh, I think the good the good uh, the, the, the good compromise is the fact that we should um, 
this is uh, and this is the, the the way that we present it uh, in in the conceptual form. Uh, it is closely linked to uh, the, the geolocalization, which is a, a new master word for uh, in in Devco. So. Uh, uh, projects that, that have a, 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 a footprint on the uh, on the ground uh, with a clear uh, clear uh, uh, and, and clearly limited uh, geographical uh, uh, scope. And uh, the, the other elements uh, which we we are also on a cons an European consensus on stabilization. We have a common understanding, a concept which have adopted which was adopted in 2017. 17, so a few, a few, a few, a few, a few, a few years uh, earlier, and this is something that it uh, shared and uh, uh, and discuss what discuss uh, among member states and main stabilization. And the third element is of course also a, qu a question of sequence, and this is the main difference that we have to establish between stabilization or sustainable uh, uh, stabilization and longer term development uh, this is in uh, uh, in particular this concern in, in particular immediate response we have to act immediately in order to stabilize the, the uh, 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 an area uh, with immediate uh, uh, services and aspect that are able to create a that will allow a longer term development. This is the way that we, 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 we intend to, to present and to, uh, to, to make a clear distinction on stability. The civilian and political surge is clearly focused on this notion of uh, stabilization. And this is the, 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 the role and the, and the task of the EU to try to operationalize it. Uh, the, the another book of question concern uh, the communication issue. Uh, I have to start uh, uh, with a very, very honest confession. I have to confess that the Secretariat of the Petroses is a very, very small team of consisting of three persons. So we don't have uh, a Stratcom, uh, Stratcom development uh, division, or whatever. Uh, and this is not an easy task to deal with communication issue to and to deal also with a project ranging for the support to the joint force, uh, uh, to uh, to the 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 the, the CSDP uh, the CSDP action, but also uh, fight against impunity, uh, also a reform and so on. But you 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 are right. We have to be uh, very cautious with the with the word that are used, in particular at the at the, at the highest level, and uh, this is something that uh, that we are fully. Uh, another point concern the key, the master, the, the key concept of mutual accountability or uh, transactional approach, whatever. Uh, this is something that I try to, 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 to explain in my, in my presentation. I said this is a, a more demanding dialogue uh, articulated or, uh, around responsibility on both sides. That means that we have to to expect more result and more commitment by our uh, by our uh, G G5 uh, counterparts, since they are uh, in charge, uh, they are the, the primary responsibility of ensuring security and ensuring stability uh, and social cohesion among uh, their population and over their territories. So this is uh, uh, in brief what uh, we we understand under. Of mutual activity, and it concerns, of course, this commitment concern of uh, reform, better governance, and also that was uh, uh, that was also mentioned the fact that we should uh, effective uh, result uh, in and uh, 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 and and fight again uh, again impunity and reinforcement of the. Uh, Criminal uh, criminal chain, which is a key issue, uh, in particular for the for the for the for the 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 the, 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 the civilian and political surge that we are supposed to operationalize and to, and to, to 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 implement in the in the coming months. Uh, this leads me to the one of the last point. But I apologize if I miss uh, uh, 
question that uh, that I, that I forgot. Uh, this concerns the role of the state. Yeah, of course, this is something that we cannot avoid at this stage, because uh, this is the, the primary subject of the of the internal re re relation, and this is uh, something that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a provider that that cannot not be avoided uh, as far as delivery of essential services is concerned, but also in terms of cohesion and uh, social cohesion and uh, uh, and uh, and um, and uh, that means that uh, what we are trying to 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 develop uh, through this idea of uh, establish um, establishment of state presence because in some as uh, some area the the, the 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 state was indeed ne ne never established but. Uh, uh, the, the, we should insist on the on the notion l'état utile, the useful state, uh, and this is uh, also in clear connection, clear connection, uh, with the, the 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 principle of better governance, uh, and that means that uh, the, the the state has to be perceived as useful by the most affected population, starting from the mo mo most vulnerable areas, uh, that have developed a kind of mistrust uh, towards the state. And that the 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 uh, this action in favor of uh, uh, establishment of state present has to be linked with uh, a better consultation with the local population, but also the provision of, uh, as said, uh, uh, essential services uh, 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 again in consultation with uh, with the, the 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 local population uh, concern. Uh, help uh, uh, answer all the questions. This is the the, the main the main uh, block of question that I identify. But uh, don't hesitate to get back to me should I avoid uh, any aspect of of importance. Thanks, Pierre. Uh, Bernardo, you want to you want to answer also these questions? Um. Yeah, I just, I just want to mention one, uh, one issue that about the, the, the G5 Sahel. And, um, and I do think that for several reasons, both political and practical reasons in terms of financial flows and so on, and the use as, a, as other international power as a, uh, as chosen to, to support uh, ad hoc regional organizations. And uh, I think that could be fine for a while, but I think in the long term it's not it's not sustainable. So another uh, choice should be should be um, planned for the future, and um, and that's more in terms of, of of regular regional organization in Western Africa. So we have the the ECOWAS that is not including you know Chad and Mauritania. That could be an issue, but we. Uh, as we said, I mean, every regional organization is a political construction, so even the G5 Sahel is a political construction, we can, we can think about that and we can think about um, the ECOWAS plus other, other countries, something like that, so we can think new format, that, that, but that could be, should be uh, sustainable for, for the future in the uh, AUs and I think ECOWAS uh, framework. Thank you. Thank you, Bernardo. Uh, I see that Eduardo has uh, raised his hand with a question, so I let you pose it. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Can you see me and hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, very nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for this amazing seminar. I'm Eduardo Valdaro. I'm currently a research fellow, Gerdanga research fellow. At Santana School in Pisa, but also associate fellow in the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles. And it's a pleasure to see you all, even if online. Just a quick question, because uh, thank you very much. I think that through your contribution, you help us in problematizing, you know, in identifying most of the limits of the European action and problematizing not only the action, but also the concept employed by the European Union. Uh, that's another concept that uh, I saw during the seminar. I just saw the uh, the reply given by the EU Council about the Malian coup d'état. 
and uh, the EU Council insisted on the need of uh, pursuing the uh, sursaut civil. Uh, this concept that was introduced or, uh, already in the uh, sursaut citoyen, sursaut civil, uh, this concept that was already introduced at the Po summit in 2020. So this new idea of the fact that also uh, local population, the, the idea of having a political solution to a political crisis, right? Uh, I'm just like to hear your impression, staying on Mali, about do you think that the European Union, generally speaking, and the international partners are really ready to accept the consequences of, of a sursaut civil? I'm thinking about Mali, probably the most legitimate figures today. The one who is, who is most followed by people in Mali is, uh, is the Imam Diko, which is a figure, let's say, that raised some issues, I would say, in Brussels, in Paris, etc. Uh, if we imagine that free elections are organized in Mali after the coup, after the second coup, let's call it the coup in the coup, if, if we imagine that Ibrahim Diko presents himself and wins the election, are we really ready? Do you think that are we ready to accept the consequences of pushing for a sursaut civil that goes in the direction preferred by local population? Because there's also, I think that there's also a tension even behind this concept, because letting people, letting Saudian people decide for their, for their own. But what happens if they do not decide in the right way, as we like it? Well, uh, Elisa, I'll bring in some questions from the chat also, because um, I see that there's, um, there's two. I, um, uh, so the first one I'm going to read on, on, on behalf of Moussa Koulibaly, who's, uh, uh, who brings us a bit more, more down to earth. So he asked to Pierre-Yves, but uh, maybe this is also generally for, um, uh, for, for, for the panel. How can you explain refugees in the refugees field fighting to get their part in the food distribution? I think this brings us maybe back a bit to that, uh, well, they're real, real human grief grievances on the ground and that some of the strategies and strategic debates are, are, are sometimes a bit detached um, from um, um, from from what is what is actually at at stake and the second one is is by um, Tony Chaffer um, panel members have rightly drawn attention to the problem of of the militarization of the Sahel in this context what should be the role going forward of the use of military force so this this reflects a bit the question that uh, that we already started to discuss on well is the G5 Sahel is this as a primarily um, a military alliance, is, is this still uh, the, the, the right way forward or how do we find alternatives? Okay, th thank you for the two questions. And, um, and Eduardo, I think we now have uh, uh, a bit to work on. Uh, I think it, I'll, I'll tackle Eduardo's question and then leave this because I think um, I think it's a very relevant question. I also think that the the question of Deco being a candidate himself is maybe not the right one. Um, and I, I, I'm always hesitant to make predictions, but this is a prediction I've made publicly before, and I, I, I feel okay making it now, that I don't think that's actually um, the concern per se, even if it is one of the concerns in Paris. Um, I think the question is more what you point at, um, the idea that uh, at a certain point, if we say that we're going to respect Malian sovereignty, which is a refrain in, in the EU and in member states, that also includes political choices. Um, so I think that's one aspect that we, we can't really draw that line, um, or, or I should say the international community, the EU can't really draw that line in the sand and say that they support governance processes, but then somehow, um, somehow, uh, how to say this, um, somehow not accept when people actually make a free choice. And then I think the other aspect of that is that um, we we do also have to recognize why figures like Mahmoud Diko um, have legitimacy and why they have legitimacy in a political arena. And at least some of that does have to do with uh, a perception of continued support for corrupt or ineffective politicians. Um, this is an ongoing thing. This is an ongoing aspect of uh, the, the increasing role of religious figures in public life. It's something that's very also very specific to Mahmoud Diko's presence in public life, but it's not exclusive to Mahmoud Diko. Um, and so that actually is what we should be reflecting on, I think, is uh, not necessarily is there a line to draw yes or no of whether or not we accept 
um, in, impact of religion in public life in a place like Mali, because religion is a part of public life in Mali. Religion is already a part of politics. Um, anyone denying that is, is simply wrong. Um, but actually asking more critical questions about why Mahmoud Diko and why other religious leaders have been able to maintain their their legitimacy and their authority, their moral authority in material terms, in religious terms and in political terms. Um, and that's actually what we should be thinking about rather than simply uh, declaring whether publicly or on background to to French journalists that uh, that it's simply an unacceptable red line for Paris to have the impact of those religious leaders, particularly when uh, in two national dialogues in Mali, uh, the need to engage with jihadist groups has been stated very clearly by these inclusive processes. Um, again, that's not uh, that's not a statement in favor of or against these kinds of negotiations, but it is something that many Malians have talked about and have asked for. And it would also be a, a huge mistake, I think, to continue to ignore that and to pretend that that's not a fact of life that we have to address and that we have to deal with. Yeah, I would also like to comment on that. I think also Ivan Gushawa wrote a really interesting piece on like the impacts of this sort of red line politics uh, and the position that it puts uh, Malian state actors in from France. Um, and I think it also shows, um, yeah, exactly these questions of like, how do you expect uh, the strategy also mentioned this ownership uh, from Malian partners when there's so little choice. And I was I was actually a bit surprised that that uh, that uh, <laughs> um, that that was the statement from Macron that they didn't uh, accept the jihadist talks because it was like um, it's very sort of a to me and a colonial interference in, in politics which is really untimely and also taking into consideration the uh, immense political discontent with uh, France politics in Mali. So I, I think we also hear sort of in order to increase legitimacy and things like that uh, we need to take those concerns from civilian and political actors that have a different kind of, um, uh, how can you say, um, 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 yeah, religious figures uh, uh, than perhaps uh, France would like to accept. But I think it's something we really need to take into consideration in order to be able to still influence things on the ground if we want to do that. Can I just quickly address um, Tony's question. Um, yeah, I think it would be a bit of a struggle to call for European or French complete security disengagement um, from the region. I think the way this is happening, and I, I mean, this is what some of what this entire conversation was about, some the, the, the way this is happening doesn't seem to be bearing very positive results. And I mean, one example, something that Bernardo mentioned, the civilian casualties made by a French Mirage strike, which killed 19 civilians and were not admitted, were not publicly confessed upon, no reparations have been organized. Something like this is is utterly wrong and is and is even strategically, I mean, it's not, it's not just morally problematic, but it's also strategically quite unintelligent. Um, on Eduardo's question, um, I think that the the recent um, the recent thing that Macron said, which was about um, he he said he linked a military transition to conversations with armed terrorist groups. So there is this this very huge conceptual pitfall that links democracy for France, and I mean, of course, it is because it is France, right? Uh, it, it links democracy automatically to non-religious, unextreme, in a French definition of it, uh, politics. And so there is this, they, they could, not, could not be aligned in the mind of Macron and his administration, which I find very interesting. Bernardo, do you want to uh, finish with some comments on the questions? I think I'm fine. I don't want to. Okay. Okay. Great. I think Signe had something to add, no? 
Yeah, it was just one thing in terms of the securitization and the development issue. I think also what I've often heard from, from civil society actors in, in Mali is also when you look at, for instance, the trust fund, which is this, which is development funds, some of the usual bidding procedures, because it was an emergency and because we had to had to act so swiftly, uh, some of those uh, processes were circumvented, which also means that um, civil society actors also in in uh, the Sahelian state have, have difficulties in reaching these funds. So there's also a way of how you construct bidding, who gets to implement uh, which kind of projects. And I think it makes a difference whether it's Scadia Civil that implements um, uh, counter terrorist police operation on cross border issues, or whether it's a local Malian or even European in partnership with um uh, local actors uh, that implement projects in terms of the development side so just saying like who we engage with with what kind of means it also matters <clears throat> okay thank you uh, pierre yves do you want to have uh, one last word before we finish this uh, webinar No, I said many thanks for the for the question. So it's very useful. <laughs> uh, not saying that it will change the, our approach, but it will help in. Uh, a lot more that we are now uh, 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 in uh, elaborating, uh, in particular as regards stabilization, uh, governance issue, uh, but also uh, the, the the many questions that you that you raise also in terms of uh, uh, security militarization of the of the of the european action this is something that we have to find the right balance and as said the main challenge as far as is uh, a better cohesion uh, co use of all uh, possible assets ranging from humanitarian assistance to when necessary military action not directly uh, uh, implemented by, by the EU, but um, uh, some of the member states. So this is something that also uh, uh, constitute uh, a major, uh, in my in my view, a major uh, value added as regards the, 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 the EU approach to, uh, to, to the Sahel, uh, which is as, uh, not, not a test case, but a good, uh, in my view, a, a good case study. Okay, thank you. So uh, I think we're going to stop here because we are already a bit past our, our end time. Uh, well, just thank you very much for, for this discussion uh, and the great interventions. Uh, I think it really made us reflect on, on many important questions and challenges that the EU is facing now uh, as it is kind of reorganizing its action and, and drafting its new strategy. Uh, and a special thanks to uh, Pierre-Yves uh, to give us a bit of time to uh, discuss with us and also answer the question. I think it was really uh, beneficial for us as well. Um, and yeah, uh, I hope to see all of you in the next webinars that we're going to have on post area and on building regional security coalitions in Africa in the next two weeks. Uh, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank